But as we start in Luke chapter 1, actually I want to remind us here last Sunday, actually two Sundays ago, a passage out of uh, Ephesians that we were talking about that was really tied to our, our teaching in Peter. In first, uh, excuse me, in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 20 it says, But you have not so learned Christ, if indeed you heard him and been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus. If the world is looking for truth, and that's Ephesians chapter 4, verses 20 and 21, where, they, where are you going to look other than the person of Jesus Christ? And as he declares himself to be truth. And so as we go into this gospel, and we'll be looking at it here tonight, we'll be discovering who Jesus is. We'll be discovering who the, uh, what, what truth is. I would like to you know, paint a scenario, and you know, again, this is just painting a scenario. Let's say that I had you guys all in a classroom setting right now, and you're sitting there, and I pass out a piece of paper to each and every one of you, and I said, now we're going to have a pop test. Don't you like those pop quizzes, pop tests? I says, and I want you to write for the next 45 minutes on those pa a piece of paper everything that you know about Jesus, his birth, his life, the things that he had, had to say, and his death. And so really that's what we're going to do as we go through that. Because hopefully at the end of the Gospel of Luke, as we study it, you'll be able to say, bring on that test. I'm ready for it. I'm prepared. You ever walk into the test where you haven't studied and you don't know what's going on? I'm a pro at that. I love those ones where you just fill in the bubbles, yes or no, whatever. But this is, I think, like what... You know, Paul was writing, and he says, you have not so learned Christ. What do we know about Jesus? You know, and that's what Luke is going to tell us. He's going to lay things straight. Luke, the author of this third gospel, was called by Paul the beloved physician. In those days, a physician was often a slave. And most people believe that that Luke, uh, being a doctor, a physician, was a slave to this fellow Theophilus that we have here. We also know that Luke was a Greek. He was a Greek, and it, I think it's interesting. And in all the all the scriptures, he's the only Gentile that had the privilege to have a book that he was able to write. Not only the Gospel of Luke, but he also was able to write what the Book of Acts, as he writes in Acts one. Uh, excuse me. The former treaties have I made unto the O Theophanes of all that Jesus began to do and teach. Otherwise, this other one that I wrote was Luke. This is the one now I'm going to write to you as Acts, the things that Jesus began to do and to teach. Theophanes, or whatever it simply means, lover of God, as he opens up, he says, Oh, excellent Theophanes, which has that idea that somewhere or another he had a, a rank and a position in the Roman governor. And, and so that's who we're introduced to this fellow in verses 1 through 4 we'll look at here tonight first. For as much as many have taken in hand, this is verse 1, to set forth in order a declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us, even as they have delivered them unto us, from which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word. It seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of, of all things from the very first to write unto thee in order, most excellent Theophanes, that thou mayest know the certainty of those things which thou hast been instructed. As you see in verse 1, the first thing he says, for as much as many. This isn't something that he just did himself. There's many eyewitnesses, as he talks about here. There's a lot of people that collaborated together to put this document. 
It's kind of like if you could think about of our Declaration of Independence. There was many people who worked on it. And Luke said he consulted with many, many people. He says that have taken in hand and set forth in order a declaration. This declaration is, if you could picture it as, a, as a, the most legal of documents. They wanted to make sure, was sure the things that they not only were writing about, but the times of the events that they were happening, so we could have this before us. And then in verse 2, even as they delivered them unto us, the they being these many witnesses, they brought them to us, which was from the beginning were I witnesses and ministers of the word. Who would be the ministers of the word? Who would be the eyewitnesses? To the disciples that he was talking to. He was talking to um, John, and he was talking to Andrew. He was talking to all of them to get this great understanding. And, and I love it. It says in verse 3, It seemed good to me also having had perfect understanding. Luke felt like he had lived it all. He had this complete understanding of the matter. You know, in a sense, Luke is like a detective. Or the detective had come onto a crime scene, has looked at everything from every angle to come up with his conclusion. And he says, I'm totally convinced what I'm giving to you is 150% true, that you're able to have otherwise perfect understanding or else complete understanding. There isn't anything else I'm leaving out what he's saying to this. He said, and I love that second part of verse 3, he says, from the very first to write unto thee in order. You know, he was wanting to set things in order. There's a lot of things that people say about Jesus, about who he is. The Jehovah Witness has something else to say about Jesus, don't they? The Mormons say something else. And there's a lot of religions that have something else to say about Jesus. But what we're going to do here at Agape Chapel, we're going to take a look what Luke had to say, go through the scriptures and come to our own conclusion who the Bible declares who Jesus is. And he says, I want to write these things. I've gathered all the information. I'm going to lay it out to you straight. So you have it directly the way it happened. And I love for the thou mayest know. He's talking to his friend, Theophanes. He says that you may know the certainty of these things. He says there shouldn't be a shadow of doubt when you read this document that's named after him, Luke. The things I'm saying are true wherein thou hast been instructed. Luke here declares that he's heard this message from the people. He was, they were actually eyewitnesses of these things. No doubt that Luke had time to spend with Mary, you know, to go over the birth of, of Jesus in chapter 1 and 2. Luke, being a doctor, obviously had some a good insight, keen insights of the event, and that was very important to him as Luke gives us the most you know, complete, uh, in, you know, information on the birth of Jesus Christ. Having what he feels to be a complete understanding, he begins to proceed to write to this man, Theophanes. He actually doesn't start the story with Jesus does this, does it? But he actually, first of all, talks about John the Baptist, who's also known as the forerunner of Jesus Christ. In verse 5, there was in that days of Herod, king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of, of the course of Abi, and his wife was a daughter of Aaron, and, she, and her name was Elizabeth. You know, what do we know? Zacharias was the tribe of Levi, making him one of the priests of the fa family of Abram, or Abraham, if you want to call it that way, and his wife was the tribe of Levi. She was a descendant of Aaron. During this time, in Jerusalem, of course, you have to picture how many Levites that they were. They estimate there were something like 20,000 Levites running around the area, willing to serve, who had been called to serve at any one time. Each family had their turn to serve. They served something like two weeks out of the year. So when your time came up, to go serve like nowadays, the National Guard or different things, you got to go serve two weeks. 
when it was their turn, they, there was time for them to go serve for two, a two-week period. You know, how they would determine what job you would do when you serve. Normally, they would cast some type of lots to be able to figure out what you were going to be doing once you got to the temple and you started to serve. And normally, once in a lifetime, you had the privilege to be able to be the one who's able to do the incense, to be able to do this. And I think it's interesting that he had this, he was able to have this, Zacharias' this glorious privilege to go and do the incense before the Lord. In verse 6, we're told concerning Zacharias and Elizabeth, and they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord blameless. Isn't this very exciting to read this? Remember, the culture in the society in Israel at this time, at best, it's very liberal. It's very polluted. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, they were, had all drifted away from the true intent of what God said in his word. But yet in the middle of all that, there are those who remain true to God's word. That's why I'm so thankful that you guys are here on a Thursday night. Why is that? You want to stay right with God. You want to study God's word and you want to do what's right. These people were righteous people. You know, I think that really, as you look at them, they would probably be quite insignificant within society. An older couple just living their life, living under the Lord. If it wasn't for them being in this story, we probably would have never, ever known anything about them. But there's many people in history who's been like that, who just love God. You might say to me, say, well, Pastor Cherry, I don't seem like I'm doing anything. Nobody really cares about me. But you know who cares about you? Our Heavenly Father. He sees and he loves you. And you just keep living for the Lord. And he says they were both righteous before God. Walking in the commandments and the ordinance of the Lord. Blameless. That's, you don't find too many people in scriptures like this, do you? They must have been quite a special type of people. Verse 7. And they had no child. Because Elizabeth was barren. And they were both were well, we're now well stricken in years. The years had really had taken a toll on them. They were uh, bent over this idea, well stricken. You know, it, you know, life back then was very hard. You know, what's the most difficult thing that I need to do is probably get out of bed, make my way to my truck, get into my truck and drive someplace, and maybe go do some shopping or do whatever. No, they had to walk every place, didn't they? They had to go plow their fields, plant their crops. You know, even when they're older, it's not like they had a supermarket sitting on the corner, did they? They had to work. And so they were bent over. They were well stricken at age. And, of course, she wasn't able to have children. And I think all of us know from that culture back then, not to be able to have children was something that they thought was a, a curse among them. Yeah, in fact, they, during that time, if... You as a husband, you found out your wife couldn't have a child. And if you decided to divorce her, they would say, hey, no big deal. We understand that. You know, they need to, somebody needs to carry out your name. And they would do that that time. But no doubt, no doubt, they had a tremendous love for each other. Do you see that in scriptures? They love God. They love God so much they allow the, that love to spill over to each other, even though she wasn't able to have a, a child. You know, Zacharias and Elizabeth, they enjoyed their bent year uh, over years together. All their lives they were able to enjoy before the Lord. Verse 8, And it came to pass that while he executed the priest's office before God in, in the order of course, of course. Of course, this is the priestly job it was laid out for them what he should do and he was doing it the way that he was supposed to do in verse 9 according to the custom of the priest's office his lot was to burn incense and he went into the temple of the lord i can imagine the excitement the pure excitement that zacharias had that day when he found out that was his job it was probably a once in a lifetime our activity that he was able to do, 
And, and just a joy to be able to serve the Lord, to be able to do that that day. In verse 10, and the whole multitude of the people were praying without at the time of incense. And, and so as you picture this, let's make sure we paint the picture right. As he was going to go into the temple and offer up the prayers, the people were on the outside. As they, the Levite or the priest would go in, they would continue in prayer to go in. And so the picture is that they would offer up a sacrifice in the morning, a lamb, and as it would burn throughout the day and the coals would come down lower, uh, low enough, down, down when it was just embers per, per, se, per se, the priest would go scoop up a bowl. And, and he, as he would scoop up the bowl, it would be on some type of string they, they have, and he would just kind of be, you know, moving around. Smoke would be going up as he would be entering into the temple. What do you think that's a picture of? Well, the Bible tells us it's our prayers that arise to God as he enters into the Lord. In Revelation <clears throat> chapter 5, verse 8, I'll read this. He says, when the lamb takes the scroll out of the right hand of him who's sitting upon the throne, and the 24 elders came forth with their little golden bowls full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints, and they are offered them before the throne of God. And so these prayers, as they're doing, God takes them as remembrance, as they're offered before the Lord. Have you ever thought that your prayers enter, go in? Go right before the throne of God. The Bible tells us that. But sometimes I think we're a little lackadaisical in realizing the beauty that we have in prayer. It tells us that we can come boldly before the throne of grace to find mercy, to find help in the time of need. At any time you get to go into the presence of the Lord. Why is that? Because the Lamb of God has made a provision for us to enter into the, the, his presence at any time. I found it's interesting when we were going through Leviticus together here at Agape Chapel. We kept on noticing, and I, I was pointing out how really exact how the, uh, the instructions on how to build the tabernacle. You remember that? How everything had to be done perfect. It was really laid out for them. Well, because the tabernacle was just a foreshadowing of the heavenly throne, the heavenly temple that's before us. And so there in chapter 5, as not only as we see Zacharias offering up the prayers of the saints, in Revelation chapter 5, we actually see it happening as they go there. And when he finishes offering his prayers, what does Zacharias do? What would the priest do? He would come back out. Where were the people? Standing out right outside as their prayers had been offered to the Lord. And what would be the benediction, benediction that the, the priest would give unto to everybody standing there? You know it. We sing it at the end of every service. The Lord bless thee, and the Lord keep thee, and the Lord make thy face shine upon thee. How beautiful this picture is that's happening right here in Luke chapter 1. They were all accustomed to this. In verse 11, though, the scene shifts gears, doesn't it? It says, And there appeared unto him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. I don't know about you. That would have been pretty cool to have videotaped to be able to see this. Or how about, how about you put your shoes on? You're just walking there and having a blessed day, and all of a sudden you say, Who is that guy standing over there? And then you realize it's an angel. And when Zacharias saw him, he was troubled, and fear fell upon him. I don't blame him at all. As he came into the presence of the Lord, you know, thinking one thing as he went in there, just uh, having joy in his heart just to serve the Lord. But God had something else. God had a message for Zacharias that he went in there. And, and the angel in verse 13 said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard, and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and they should call his name John. And so here he is. First of all, he tells him, he says, thy prayer is heard. What prayer? I got a feeling for all those years where Elizabeth's husband, Zacharias, was praying for her, saying, Lord, would you please allow my wife to bear a child? 
probably knowing the desire of his wife to have a baby. You know, we, we don't have it recorded, but we could just kind of see it in there. And for thy prayer is heard that he was praying. And this baby is now going to be born as he, and I think it's one thing that we can learn from this about Zacharias for our own life, for us not to give up in prayer. Remember, what condition are these guys in? They're bent over. It says they're well stricken in age. But the angel said, hey, guess what? She's going to have a baby, and you're going to call his name John. John is an interesting name. The short name of it we call John, but it's Johannam, which actually means the Lord is gracious. Isn't God gracious here to Zacharias and Elizabeth to give them a child in their olden age? In verse 14, And thou shalt have joy, and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth, and he shall be in great, the in great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither uh, strong drink, and he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost, uh, even from his mother womb. Womb, and many of the children of Israel shall turn, uh, turn to the Lord their God, and shall go before him in the spirit of the power of Elijah to turn the hearts of their father to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just and to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Wow. Not only am I going to have a baby, this baby's going to do tremendous things, isn't he? Do you remember the last word that God said to the nation there in the Old Testament out of the book of Malachi? It's in Malachi chapter 4, verse 5. Let me read it to you. He says, Behold, I will send you Elijah, the prophet before the coming and the great awesome day of the Lord, and he shall turn the hearts of their fathers to their children and the heart of the children to their father, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. How long has it been since the God has spoken that, that words to, to the, you know, that back to Malachi? It's been how many years? 400 years. Now we see the first thing that we hear from the Lord there in the temple, speaking to this priest that walks in. He says, guess what? You, this is going to happen. Your son's going to be born, and he's going to have that spirit of Elijah come upon him. And, of course, this is the last words of the old covenant where the angel met with him. He said, even though he's been silent for uh, 400 years. Now he tells them also in verse 15, he shall be great in the sight of the Lord. This guy, John, is going to be great. And he, not only that, he tells them that he'll be to, of the Nazarite vow. Did you see that? Where he is not going to be drinking wine or strong drink, but be, he'll be what? Filled with the Holy Spirit. Once again, we see the importance of our lives and the ministry that we give. And here's this angel telling him, he says, what's so key for our lives as we set forth in ministry is to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And so he's going to be filled with the Holy Spirit. In a little bit, we'll study with Mary when, well, I think it's interesting, we'll get it in maybe in next week's verse uh, uh, teaching uh, Tim asked me, he says, are you going to finish Luke 1? I said, oh, there's 66 verses. So I said two weeks, I said maybe three weeks. We'll see how it goes. But isn't it amazing as John is born and, and I mean, John's in the womb and, and as she goes and meets her cousin Mary, and it says the baby within him, within her, leaps for joy. As it tells us in verse 15, let's look at that again, the last part. And he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost, even from his mother's womb. We'll see that take place here uh, next week or the week after, here in Luke chapter 1. Amazing. In verse 16, it says that Zechariah said unto the angel, Whereby shall I know this? For I am old, and my wife is well stricken in years. All of a sudden, of this man that we are told it was pretty righteous, that was walked with God, really had a good, solid relationship, but he staggered, didn't he? 
He staggered at the promise of God. He staggered at the word that God spoke to him. And in one sense, that's encouraging to me. Because if I see this godly man staggered at this time, because at times I stagger. And I remember that one guy in speaking to Jesus, he says, Lord, I want to believe, but help me with my unbelief. You ever been there before? And so he, he said, he says, I just need a sign. You know, I was talking the other day, maybe it was I here at church, I don't know. No, I don't know why this cartoon came up in my mind was kind of, remember Felix the cat? The wonderful cat, he said, where he just pulled something out of a bag, whatever. Was that what Zacharias looking for? Some type of, show me some kind of sign to make sure I'm not, I, I, I could do this. What was he doing? Wasn't he looking at his own ability? I think that's so true so often to us as we look at a situation, we filter it through our ability rather than God's ability. And the Lord is always trying to pull out of us. Now, and I 100% believe, at least in my life, maybe that not for your life, but in my life, when I go through trials, God's trying to pull faith out of me. He's, they come to my life so I can grow, so I can put my trust in him rather than my, you know, I've given up on how smart I am. At least I try to, you know, because every time I do it, I get myself in trouble. I make a mess of things. And God's saying, hey, just wait upon me. Trust me. Peter tells us um, that we need, as we come to situations, Zacharias probably should have did this, is to cast their cares upon the Lord, under the Lord, because he cares for us. And he probably should say, oh, I don't understand how this is all going to work, Lord, but I'm going to trust you for it, and I'm going to believe you. But he didn't believe. And we know the story in verse 19. And the angel answered and said unto him, I am Gabriel. <laughs> we should wake up if you guys ever hear Gabriel. He says, I am Gabriel, that stand in the presence of God and, and sent to speak unto thee and show thee glad tidings. He says, I'm going to tell you this. I stand in the presence of God. Do you remember when else we saw Gabriel? All the way back into Daniel where he talked about the things that come uh, uh, concerning the, the presence of the Lord when Jesus was going to come. And he says, as he goes on in verse 20, And behold, thou shalt be dumb, and not able to speak until the day these things shall be before, performed, because thou believest not my words, which shall be fulfilled in their season. He wanted a sign. I don't think he was expecting this kind of sign, do you? But he wasn't able to speak, wasn't able to say a word. God's going to do something. God's going to do a tremendous thing as we see Luke unfold. Despite our unbelief, God continues to work. Do you believe that? God works beyond what we can, you know, even put our faith in. There are those who try to get us to say, he says, you got to have enough faith for in order for God to work. I say, baloney with that. God will work. God's going to continue to work. He's going to accomplish his purposes. The, the, the thing is, is when I put my faith in him, I get to reap the benefits of the joy of seeing him work. The, the work of God will get done. We might lose out on the rewards of the blessings and experiences, but we're not going to stop God from working. And so, Here's Zacharias, filled with unbelief. How can I know this? I'm old. I'm an old man. My wife is old. Old woman. What do you mean that we're going to have a son, Gabriel? And I don't doubt that many of us, myself included, might at that point at least question the Lord. But yet God continued to do a work even though Zacharias doubted. In verse 21, and the people waited for Zacharias and marveled that he tarried so long in the temple. Otherwise, they probably figured, you know, he goes in there, does his thing, 45 minutes, he's out, right? He was there a long time. And when he came out, he could not speak unto them. And they perceived that he had seen a vision in the temple, for he beckoned unto them and remained speechless. So as he came out, it's almost like he's given sign language and trying to... I can't speak. And then finally they got it. They realized what he was doing. 
And it came to pass that as soon as the days of his administration were accomplished, he departed to his own house. He left to go back to Judea where he's from. It's not very far from Jerusalem. And after those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived and hid herself five months, saying, Thou hast, thou hast the Lord dealt with me in the days wherein he looked upon me to take away my reproach among men. We haven't said too much about Elizabeth up to this point. We'll talk more about her in our study next week. But here she's looking, this reproach that she was carrying. You know, of course, us guys, we have no idea what she's talking about because we don't, you know, we're not women. But she had this in her heart that she wasn't maybe fulfilled. She didn't do it complete, you know, and something wrong with her or something. But it was a reproach, probably those who were getting after her. We've seen this in the Old Testament, other women who couldn't bear children and how other women were making fun of her. But yet God saw her and blessed her. Even though she had a marvelous husband, she walked with the Lord, and I believe that she lived a full life. But God says, I have something for you. His name's going to be John, because you're going to know John a man who's going to do marvelous things because I've called him to be the forerunner of Jesus Christ. So tonight, we got a little snapshot. We got a little look at what Luke had to say on how he's going to set in order for us the gospel. So at the end, probably in about six months when we finish Luke or whatever it is, I hope that we all learn and we all grow. As Peter tells us that we might grow and grace in our knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, Father. Give me-